Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome in. I'm Ian Douglas. I'm the author of this website, techinterview.guide. Welcome in. Sunday is interview prep day. We're going to get you ready for your job hunt this week. Ash Prince, good to see you in chat. Um, and yeah, big hello to uh, everybody that happens to drop by. If you're watching this on YouTube later on, hello. Um, you can check out all kinds of free content over at techinterview.guide. There's no ads on any of it, uh, no paid promotions, anything like that. All my content's free. Today we're going to do at least one resume review. If other folks drop by, if you also want a resume review, um, you can do exclamation point resume in chat, and that'll give you a link where you can go submit a resume for a review. Um, let's see, it's July. We're doing like a ton of giveaways for the month of July. We crushed our community goal for the fundraiser. Um, and so I've added some new prizes. There's a 3D printer on the, on the prize list. And uh, we've also added a cosplay helmet for, uh, for other big giveaways. So aside from all the dragons and stuff like that, that were, that were, you know, 3D printing and airbrushing and all the stuff. I got the resin print started back here. Uh, it's all ready to go. We're gonna be airbrushing all of that stuff over the next couple of weeks. And that'll all be ready to go in early August for the July giveaways. Um, so feel free to drop by. If you came by for the two-year stream anniversary last night, I gave out like tons and tons and tons of, of uh, giveaway points. Um, we had some people walk away with like thousands of points by the end of the night. It was great. It was a good time. I am back. And uh, I don't want to jinx anything, but that hot sauce was not a big deal. Like after the fact. I mean, the mouth was on fire, but like everything after that, no problems whatsoever. I don't, again, I don't want to jinx it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been fine. So anyway, the giveaway today, uh, for the daily giveaway, we're gonna draw one winner and it's gonna be a coupon code for cool3dthings.com, which is the website that I use for my 3D printing and laser engraving. Uh, that'll be our giveaway. Um, we'll do that in a little while. Uh, you will need to be in chat to claim the prize. I think I got the claim thing working. I think I got it working and it'll like turn off the timer and all this stuff, so we'll, we'll see. Knock on wood. Hey, Mr. Rick, good to see you as well. Thanks for dropping in. Uh, no After Effects. No, Mark H. It's uh, It's been fine. Like I said, I don't want to jinx anything, but I mean, considering how much ghost pepper hot sauce y'all made me consume last night, um, and I also realized we actually only gave away one spool of Polymaker filament last night. I tried to give away the second one, but everybody wasn't around, and then I got distracted by other things. Um, and talking about the 3D printer that we added, and then talking about the cosplay helmet that we're going to do, and, and all that kind of stuff. I realized I, I went back and I watched the VOD, and uh, we never gave away the second spool of Polymaker filament. So we could draw for that today, because we did hit that goal. And I did say if we hit $1,000 on this community goal, I would give away a spool of filament. So we'll give that away today. Uh, but we did give away one of them. We'll give away the second one today. Um, something, something, you mean picks? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Pix was a, a real champ. Between Pix and RC Maniac and G Who Is J, like dropping tons of donos, uh, we raised over a thousand dollars last night alone, like a thousand and fifty dollars or something like that for uh, for STEM to the future. And we still got like the rest of July and all of August to go. Um, so if we can hit two thousand as a community, I'm gonna add something else to the to the prize list. I don't know what it's gonna be. But, uh, but if you do exclamation point prizes, you'll see that the 3D printer and the cosplay helmet are up there now. And I also readjusted the, the maximum number of tokens that you can reserve as well. Since we gave out just tons and tons of points, um, I did want to kind of cap how many tokens you could reserve for uh, certain prizes. So um, but those are all up and running. You should be able to start reserving tokens for those. Uh, one person came back, but it was past the point. Yeah, Britt came back, uh, but had missed the, the giveaway. And then everybody else that I was drawing names, they had already gone for the night. And then I got distracted talking to Astro about getting into 3D printing. Uh, and then I realized after watching the VOD, I never went back and like gave away the second spool. So Almighty Malachi got the first spool of filament, but we never got the second one. And then we did the hourly draws and then, you know, we kind of wrapped up for the night. And I never go gave away the second spool of Polymaker filament. So we'll give that one away today. And that one's sponsored by me, not by Polymaker. So the one we gave away last night, that one's from Polymaker, and they filled out the form, and hopefully that one's good. Um, but the uh, the second spool that we're going to give away, uh, so we'll, we're technically going to do two giveaways today. One's going to be for a spool of 3D printer filament, and the other giveaway will be a coupon code for my website, and it'll be enough for several laser engravings plus shipping. <clears throat> so nine spoons of hot sauce. I'm pretty sure it was more than nine, uh, and one of them was a blend of, like, many of the hot sauces. I think we blended four of the hot sauces together 
and I realized I filled up the spoon with three of them, and so I filled up a fourth teaspoon, like a teaspoon with a fourth one, and just had that. Um, but yeah, I, I lost count of how many spoonfuls of ghost pepper hot sauce I ended up consuming last night on the stream, but it was all for a, a good cause for sure. Uh, when does Astro get into 3D printing? I mean, we got to get Astro a 3D printer, and then Astro will get into 3D printing, I'm sure. I would love to see what Astro does with the telescopes and stuff like that if Astro Canuck were to get into uh, you know, 3D printing as well, what kind of accessories he would get into printing for his telescopes and stuff. Um, Cajun Dragon, thanks again for dropping by. Uh, thanks again for all the support and, and everything last night. We gave away a ton of stuff last night. Tons of Lego kits, tons of 3D printed stuff. Um, it was it was fantastic. Uh, again, thank you for, for the support and everybody that dropped by. Uh, today I've got at least one resume review to go through. And then I also want to go over and share some notes that I came up with. Um, so for those that have heard of Scrimba, it's a programming boot camp based over in Europe. And I did a podcast with them a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago. And they have, they have regular guests on their podcast all the time. Um, I'm actually the first guest that they've asked to come back to do a second episode. And at the end of that episode, we're like, we should do a third episode. <laughs> um, and so I'm the, I'm the first guest that's going to have a, a second appearance on their podcast. And we recorded that about a week ago. And I actually want to go over some of the notes that I wrote down because there was like we had very limited time. And I think from the sounds of what we did with that podcast, they're actually going to break it up into like a bunch of like mini episodes. Um, but I kind of want to go over like what some of those thoughts were. And the whole theme is like, what do you do when you start a job? Specifically for entry level type of roles, like what kinds of things should you do and why? Uh, originally we were just going to do like, here's a list of things you should do when you start a job. But I wanted to kind of approach it at, from a why point of view. Like, why does it matter? Like, why are we telling you to do extra stuff on top of the job that you're already doing? Like, what should you be doing? Um, and it's not to overload you because you're already going to feel pretty overwhelmed with starting a new job. So it's not to give you more work, but it's to kind of make you stand out and to sort of adjust you to this is what your career is going to be like. And here are some ways that are going to make that a little bit easier for you, hopefully. Um, so I want to share some of those thoughts as, uh, as we go through today. Like I said, I got one resume to go through. If we can do, a, you know, if anyone wants to submit another one, then uh, let me know in chat that you're submitting a resume. If you have questions, you can use exclamation point Q, um, just exclamation point Q followed by your question. Um, just in case I don't see it in chat, I would prefer if you use the Q for that. And then uh, we'll draw from those kind of as we go. Um, like I said, we've got one resume to go through. They did anonymize it mostly. Um, they've got their full name on there, but they checked the check mark saying everything else is okay to show. Um, so I think it's got their LinkedIn and their GitHub and then, um, but you know, their email and their phone number are not on the resume, but we'll, we'll go over that kind of as we go. Um, and yeah, explaining the why I think is, is most important, not just go do this, but like, why, why are we telling you to do that? What's the long-term impact? Like, how is that going to help kind of overall? So I kind of want to go over the notes that I wrote down for their podcast and then kind of recap it at the end of like, why is all this stuff important? So I kind of want to go through that today. If you have questions about interview prep, career prep, if you want a resume review, exclamation point resume, it'll give you the link to submit a resume. If you've got questions, please ask. Um, my goal is that I'm going to stream for like 90 minutes-ish and then kind of wrap up from there. So I'd love to get through all this in 90 minutes. And in, we've got two giveaways to do. So I'm going to kind of space that out kind of as we go. I'll probably start with the resume review and we'll do the Polymaker giveaway. And then we'll go through some of the other notes. Then we'll do the other giveaway kind of after that. So um, let's see. What did I miss in chat? Lots of listening over here. Awesome. Um, have I looked at the Stack Overflow Dev Survey results? I glanced at it, but I didn't pay a ton of attention to it. Postman also came out with their State of the API report for 2023. And I've kind of dabbled in some of that because I'm going to be preparing conference talks and stuff over that. So I've been spending more time on that than the Stack Overflow one. Uh, if I ever hire people, I want to just ask them what their qualifications are. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, Humbler John, good to, uh, good to have you back. Um, oh, we did not pick a daily recipient for today. Um, I was testing out the claim thing, and that seems to have worked. So I'm going to go through and like remove myself. So I was, I was using my work account to test, but you can certainly get in on the giveaway for the day. Um, but ignore the, uh, the thing that says we've already drawn a winner. We have not yet drawn any winners, but I'm pretty sure the claim command is going to work this time. 
So as opposed to yesterday, we were giving all the stuff away and the claim command wasn't working. Uh, it should work. Uh, it should work now. Um, your stream title is still Donothon. Oh, my bad. Thank you for that. Let's do uh, career prep and interview prep for the week ahead. Um, plus giveaways. Drop by and ask questions. Thanks. I knew I was forgetting to do something earlier today. All right, so that title has changed. Thanks for uh, alerting me to that. Mojo, good to see you in chat. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, exclamation point giveaway. Get in on the giveaways. Uh, everybody's eligible. And again, the uh, the main like daily giveaway prize today is going to be uh, a coupon code for cool3dthings.com. It's the site where I do my laser engraving and stuff. The coupon code, probably going to aim for like $15, which you can apply towards a 3D print or you can apply towards any of the laser engraving. Um, if you get like one or two laser engravings, it should also cover the shipping domestically. If you're international, then you might there might be a little bit extra that you have to pay. Um, depending on how many laser engravings you want, you can go through and you'll be able to pick whatever you want. Uh, what kind of, like, do you want it on wood? Do you want it on a slate coaster? Um, or do you want, like, wooden coasters? You've got your pick. Basically, the coupon code is just going to be a dollar amount for the website, and you can kind of go pick whatever you want. Um, and I'm going to not put an expiration on the coupon code. So, um, so you'll be able to use it, and uh, hopefully, ideally... Uh, I can build these coupon codes in a way that you can stack them. And so if you end up with multiple coupon codes for the site, that you can apply them to like a bigger item later on. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. Hey, Harpender. Um, let's see, what else I miss? Why are the giveaway results being different? It should no longer... Oh, that's because I had still flagged that as a winner. That's why. Um, all right, that should be corrected now. I do see the giveaways for the day. Let me go sort by this column. Sort of sending. There we go. All right, so now everybody's down at the bottom, and I'm just going to remove the row from my work account. Delete that record. All right, so we're good. So I won't tell you anymore that we've already drawn a winner. Uh, everything's everything should be good to go from there. Um, I tried to re-enter. It said already entered. Yep. Yeah, ignore the already selected part. That was just from me testing things earlier. So I removed that row, so you won't get that message anymore. Um, yeah, you've already entered. There you go. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's start with a resume review. So let's go back over to here. Yeah, go back over to here. All right. So this is a resume that we got in, and I'm gonna just do a quick review on this. Um, so the first thing I like to do is kind of zoom out on the resume. What's the overall kind of layout look like? This one's Kind of got a lot of content on there, but generally speaking, the layout's pretty clean. It's pretty easy to see. We got a summary. We got some professional experience. We got some education on there. We got their skills kind of mid-page, and then project experience down at the bottom. For me as a hiring manager, um, I like to see all the important stuff in the top half of the page. So what do I need to know about whether you're qualified for the job that I've got posted? I like to see that answered on the top half of the page. So me personally... I would prefer to drop the summary, see your skills and your project work. If you're, if you're looking for an entry-level role, I would like to see skills and then project work and then maybe education and then any other like related experience. Uh, we'll kind of go over some of the stuff. They do have some professional experience uh, before they went to this boot camp uh, in, in, uh, at Turing. It's not really a boot camp. They call it a program. It's seven months long. Um, but they're graduating this June, so they're they're getting ready to graduate from Turing. Um, and so we'll look at this a little bit. So they've actually got a bachelor's in computer science, and then they went to Turing to get like a web development uh, kind of background, it looks like, in front end. Um, so we're going to dive in on this a little bit and kind of see like where things sort of pan out. Some people are going to look at this a little bit, and uh, no, I'm not going to do a clip because the clip thing's broken. Um, I'll just go back and do it manually later, but thanks. Um, the the thing is if you if you've got a cs degree and you've been working in the field because it looks like they graduated with a cs degree in 2015 they started working professionally in 2017 and they did that job for five years and then they went back to school to get into web development so we'll dive into that a little bit so maybe it's not as important that the skills are like down below 
that professional experience is obviously going to be a lot more important. And I will zoom in on this. I'm just doing this at a very macro level, and then we're going to dive in. Um, so they've got some professional experience where they've, they've used their CS degree, and then they went back to school to get into more web development side of it. So we're going to dive in a little bit. I think I would still like to see the skills at the top. So if you want to keep the summary, okay, then we'll get into skills and then the professional experience because that's going to be more important than the project work depending on what kind of role that you're going for. So we're going to dive in on this and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what kind of role they're actually looking for. So let me do this. I need to go find a different browser, which is over here. And I need to pull this up. So these are the details that they gave me with the resume submission. So when you when you submit a resume to me for review, it'll ask you some notes like, what kind of job are you looking for and so on. Uh, and they basically wrote down, I'm a career switcher coming from another tech industry with quite a different tech stack. Am I balancing my old and new experience enough or should I lean harder one way or the other? The answer to that's always going to be depends. Uh, but they are looking for a front end engineer, software engineer, junior engineer, don't ever level yourself, just go for engineer. Um, and that's all they gave me as far as detail. So the main ask here, aside from looking for an entry level role, I'm a career switcher coming from another tech industry with a very different tech stack. Am I balancing my old and new experience enough or should I lean harder one way or the other? So let's dive in on the resume here a little bit. So. I, I did say the, the answer to this question is going to depend a little bit on what kind of role you want to get. The fact that you've gone to Turing and that you want to focus on front-end development means you're going to be applying for front-end roles. Ideally, you're going to be applying for front-end roles. If that's the case, then you, your resume needs to lean towards being a front-end developer. At the very top here, you're calling yourself a software engineer. What's up, Whip? Um, you're calling yourself a software engineer. So you're not really focusing on being a front-end developer. You're, that title is very generic. And so if you're going to go for a front-end role, I would, call, I would put a title in here of like front-end developer. If you're looking for more of the back-end, low-level, computer science-y type of role, similar to what you had here where you're a senior controls programmer, and we'll dive in on this experience in a minute, then you probably want to keep more of the software engineer type of title because that's going to be more applicable for those kinds of roles. So it does kind of depend on what jobs you apply to or which jobs you intend to apply to. And we'll kind of go from there. So let's take a look at the summary on here. So at, at the very top, they've got their location. Again, I usually tell people, take the location off of your resume unless you're looking for a job in that specific area and you're willing to drive to an office. If you're looking for a remote job, take the location off completely. If you're planning to relocate, if you really want to put a location on there, put the location of where their job is. So it makes it look like you're already there. And if they say like, oh, we see you live in Kansas, in this case, you'd be like, well, I'm actually planning to move to Kansas. That's why I'm looking for jobs in Kansas. So I'm intending to be there by a certain time range. And so I want to get through some interviews and I want to have a job ready to go when I get there. And then if you get the interview and you get the job, then you plan to move to Kansas. And then you can negotiate for moving expenses and things like that. Um, and that's, that's kind of how you get around that. But generally, I tell people, take the location off the resume because it can subject you to geographic bias. Um, they've got their GitHub on here. They got their link down here. That would be fine. The only thing missing is a phone number. They might have taken that off just for anonymity, but I would get a phone number on the resume for sure. Let's look at the summary. Experienced former senior industrial controls, HMI, and database programmer with seven years of real-world engineering project experience. Um, that's a mouthful. Uh, holds a BS in computer science and an accredited certificate in front-end engineering, transitioning from industrial controls to software engineering, leveraging strong problem-solving technical and collaboration skills. Overall, it's a pretty strong summary. You are talking about kind of the background and how you're transitioning into, you know, you're looking for this kind of front-end uh, type of role. So you've got a background in industrial control. You've got a background as a database programmer, seven years of real world experience, although that doesn't line up from June 2017 to November 2022. That's only five years of experience. Oh, sorry, there was extra experience down here, different 
same company, different role. Okay, so yeah, seven years. Um, but then you went and got a certificate in front-end engineering, transitioning from industrial controls to software engineering. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that is and what that means and what kind of software engineering do you want to be doing? Leveraging strong problem solving, technical collaboration skills, that's fine. Overall, it's a pretty good summary where you're talking about like, this is how I'm kind of, you know, this is the background that I bring and what I what I'm want to move into. But you want to move into like a software engineering role. That's pretty vague. Like, tell me what kind of role are you looking to get into? Are you looking to get into front end? Are you looking to be kind of that middleware? Like, where do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up here? So let's look at the professional experience. So working at this job, senior controls programmer. Um, so you developed HMI programs. Try to avoid buzzwords and jargon unless you're going to explain what HMI is. Because me, for example, I mean, I did control programming like, um, oh gosh, what did they even call them? PDP 11s and things like that, like industrial programming, like way back in college, back in 96, I don't know what HMI stands for off the top of my head. I, if I ever learned it, I don't recall what it is. And so putting that kind of thing on a resume, people are just going to glance at that and go, all right, I have no idea what HMI is. So either spell it out or explain it, or just don't use the terminology, find a way to kind of abstract it, and like almost an explain like I'm five kind of mentality. Uh, for industrial control systems, utilized to automate operations in 10 grain handling facilities. Okay, five airport baggage handling facilities and other custom automation systems. Ah, that's cool. Provider on-site commissioning and customer training of industrial control systems. Okay. Built visualization reports for industrial control process. Developed and maintained company software standards utilized as starting points for new projects. Train new hires on implementing company standards in grain handling and baggage handling. Okay, created internal software tools for resource management leadership programs. Okay, that's a lot of, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. The more you can show the impact of what that had, um, and, and you kind of, you show that impact in that first bullet point where you're talking about, here's how many facilities my software got put into. So it wasn't just, I built a thing. I know how many places this actually went out to. So 10 grain f handling facilities, five airport baggage handling facilities. Um, you're showing the impact of what you did. The more you can add impact on those bullet points, like you did commissioning and customer training, but how did that help? How did that make things better? Did it reduce the overall support for the fact that you went and did like on-site customer training? You built visualization reports for the control process. Okay, but so what? Not so what as in that's not important, but like what was the impact of that? Uh, develop, maintain company software standards. Okay, how did that make the team better? So the more that you can kind of talk about like this was the impact that I had, especially when you were a senior level developer, you want to bring more of that impact in into here. Because when I'm reading over your resume, you want me to think, oh, I want Jason to come do that up here. Like I want to call you so you can come do that here. Not just like, okay, you did these things and I, you know, that's the role that we have. So, okay, you can like, I, you could probably step into this role. I want to look at your resume and go, because of that impact, I really want to reach out and talk to you and get you interviewing with our company because I want you to have that same impact here. Not just that you're coming to do that work here, but you're going to have that similar impact at my company. So the more you can talk about the impact that it had and like why that mattered, the better off I think this, this resume is going to come across. Um, before you got into the senior level, you were just controls programmer and utilized existing company standards to build HMI programs and user manuals. And then later on, you created your own internal software tools and you developed new coding standards. So that shows growth in the company. You're showing that progression of skill. And that's what we want to see. We want to see more than I just did the same thing over and over and over and over. This shows a progression of I used existing company standards and then later on you developed and maintained other standards. So you were able to kind of adapt this and make the team better by doing this. So I had to kind of piece that together by reading these bullet points. So the more you can kind of bring that across and like show me that impact, 
uh, the better off you're going to be. Now, you do need to be careful that these bullet points don't become enormous, but this is actually a pretty good high-level abstraction of the skills that you're bringing on top of the fact that you're a programmer. You're showing a lot of high-level thinking here, which is great because you're kind of encapsulating all of your skill into these broader points of like, this is what I bring as a senior dev. From there, you're diving right into education and showing me the skills block and so on. Um, I would probably put that skills block up above. Um, again, I wanna be able to see in a hurry, like, are you qualified for this job? Now, if you're going for a front end role, you're showing me a lot of content here that's not front end development. So if you are applying for front end roles, none of this tells me anything about front end other than you got this certificate certificate in front end development but this whole top half of the page that that we're looking at here has almost nothing to do with front end development and so i'm either going to glance over it and miss it completely because i'm looking for where you did front end development or i'm going to spend time reading all this and go okay like this person's not qualified for a front end role and i'm going to stop reading so you have to solve my problem in the first half of the page. If I'm looking for a front-end dev and I'm trying to find somebody to solve a particular front-end development problem, you need to solve that in the top half of the page. So I think while the summary is good, I think you could reduce it a little bit and bring the skills block up top if you're gonna be applying for front-end roles. Call yourself a front-end developer, bring your skills block up to the top so that I can see immediately that you've got these JavaScript skills. Then you can talk about your professional experience because by then I'll have read the summary, but then I see your modern skills in JavaScript and then I see your professional experience after that. I think that's gonna be a better transition of like going from the summary, seeing your skills, seeing your experience, and then get into the education and then your education project experience. I think that'll be a better transition. So summary, skills, professional experience. Um, so the only thing I would really do is move the skills block in between the summary and experience. I think that's the only layout change I would make there. Um, education wise, I think this is fine. Um, you've just got your graduation times on here. I think that that's fine. Now Turing is remote, so you can just put remote on here. Otherwise it looks like you are actually on campus in Denver and Turing has been remote since the pandemic, since March, 2020. Um, and so you don't have to put their location. I would just put remote on there. Um, skills block wise, you've got all your front end development stuff and then you're starting to get into more of the back end stuff that you, that you worked on. You've got GitHub, GitHub projects, responsive layouts, and then you're getting into more back end. So you're going front end, kind of like back end technologies, and then you're talking about kind of how you do your work, and then you're back into front end, and then you're back into back end, and then you're getting into things that are unrelated to front end development. So I would probably break these up a little bit. I might do like front end skills and put like JavaScript, TypeScript, React, HTML, CSS, Redux. Uh, responsive layouts and then do like middleware you know where you do like your Python and API's and and so on um, or however you want to like add those in as skills maybe just back-end where you've got like Python API's Microsoft SQL um, and, and um, sorry Microsoft SQL MySQL um, and uh, see, we talked about Python, and then you could just have other tools where you've got GitHub, GitHub projects, 3D modeling, 3D printing. I would say if, if, if the places where you're applying for jobs don't do any 3D related things, you could probably leave off the 3D modeling and 3D printing. I don't think it's gonna be as important to most of those jobs. So I think you could probably leave those off the resume. Unless a company where you're applying actually does 3D modeling or you know that their industry involves 3D printing, but then you kind of need to show me like how you've done 3D printing and why that's even on your resume. Otherwise it's like, oh, okay, you dabble in 3D printing, but there's nothing else on the page that tells me anything about your 3D printing or how you built that into a project or anything like that. So it's not that it's a bad thing, the other thing that, that's really missing on here is really talking about like the test driven development and, and things like that. Um, and so getting into more of the testing tools and things like that, it might be good to show those kinds of skills as well. 
Um, how you want to kind of lay that out in a skills block is kind of up to you. If you do exclamation point resume sample, you'll see some samples of how I do, uh, like how you can kind of build out that skills block different ways. And that'll give you some ideas that, uh, that you can kind of uh, uh, play with kind of as we go. Good little bot picking up on my voice commands. Hey, Free Heaton, thanks for dropping in. As far as the project experience goes, let's talk about your project experience. So right away, you're giving me the name of the project. You're giving me a live link where I can go experience it. And then you're giving me a link to the front end repository here. You're giving me the tech stack of what you use to go build it. Um, and you've got things in here that you don't mention in your skills block, like material UI. You do talk about responsive layouts, and so responsive CSS, that's fine. But you don't have material UI in your skills block um, or open API or open AI. Um, now, these will hit on the keywords, but if your projects are down at the bottom and your skills block is up at the top, now they're like they're bouncing back and forth on the page. They got all your projects down at the bottom, then they got to go to the top of the page and kind of correlate. Like, why didn't you have that on your skills block? You used it on this project. You don't have it in your skills block. So does that mean you don't want to talk about material UI? Do you not know it well enough to interview on the thing? Did you kind of dabble in it, but you didn't really like do anything extensive in it? Things like that. Uh, developed a React app. Yes, you've already told me that already. You, I can see it's a, it's a web app. You worked on the front end. You've already told me that this is React and React Router. So don't be redundant about this. Allows users to input a terms of service and receive concise, understandable information based on areas of concern. This is what I call a user impact statement or kind of your elevator pitch. I would word this a little bit differently um, about, well, actually, I, I think you do a pretty good job talking about why the user would use this or how the user would use this. Um, me personally, I like to see that first. Tell me the tech stack later. Like you need to kind of hook me on like, this is what I built and how cool it is. And then later on, tell me how you built it. Because I think that's where folks are gonna uh, care a little bit more about the impact that you had by really emphasizing like, I'm a front end developer. So obviously I care about the user experience. And so this is what I built for the user and why that matters to a particular persona of users and so on. So give me that user impact statement first and tell me the tech stack a little bit later on. So what I like to see, for example, is this user impact statement kind of in a, in a line right under the name of the project and so on. And then give me the bullet points of like what you learned and what the main learning goals of this project were. And then the very last bullet point is your tech stack of like how you built the thing out. Uh, collaborate with a backend team to consume a custom API supporting both text and PDF inputs. Overall, this is pretty good. This was what you learned by building out this project. Um, so I would I would take off these first couple of words here because yes, you've already told me it's a React app. Obviously, you're a developer, so don't be redundant with your phrasing. Um, I would just take off these first couple of words. Um, overall, other than that, I think that this is okay. Me personally, I'm not a fan of the vertical bar as a separator, but that's just me. Um, I like that you've got the URL on here. I would actually make that a clickable link. So right now I can't actually click on that. And so people might look at that and if they don't know that Vercel is like a place to host something, they're gonna look at that and go, what is this? Is this part of your project name? They may not understand that you've actually launched this and this is how to get to the thing. So make that a clickable link or put HTTPS or something in front of it so I know that that's a URL. Again, you gotta explain like I'm five, because many of the recruiters that are looking at your resume are not necessarily going to be technical and they're not going to understand that this is a website to go to. So either put the protocol in front of it or make it a clickable link. Uh, let me mute for just one second. All right, sorry about that. Um, all right, 
So same thing on the other projects, you know, same, same kind of thing with the website here. So Mars Chronicles, um, JavaScript, React, Redux. So yeah, you're using a lot of the same skills. Created a React web app. Again, you're being redundant on, on the wording here, so take these kinds of things off. Exploring data and photos from the Mars rover's mission. So tell me a little bit more about why the user is going to care about this. Like, why, why did you build this? It wasn't just, I built this thing, but like, tell me why you built it. Like, um, I did this to, uh, you know, bring more uh, understanding of like what goes into the Mars missions or, you know, I built this so that, you know, people unfamiliar with space programs, you know, like, tell me about why this matters to the user. You're a front end developer, you're going to care about user experience. So tell me more about why the user is going to use this thing. Uh, nominated as a demo competition finalist, that's fine. You know, it's, it's neat to see that this was a good enough project that it made it into a contest. It doesn't have to place at the contest, it doesn't have to win a prize. The fact that it's nominated is fine. Um, baggage handling system, again, this is a project that you did that wasn't school related. So you may want to specify for these that these were school projects and that this was some other project for work. Now, being a project at work, you may actually want to move this whole project up into the professional experience because project experience here, this is like project-based learning, where this is the project that you actually built at this job. And so these aren't the same. This project is not the same as these projects. These were like, I built this thing to go learn this thing. This was like the main project that I did at my job. So I would actually put some of this stuff up top with the professional experience or like just talk about like, here's what that handling system was all about. Um, again, I don't know what Ignition is. So you may want to explain a little bit about what Ignition is. Python, Microsoft SQL Server, Windows Server. Again, you don't have Windows Server in your skill set. So if that's an important thing that you want us to know, then you need to provide that as like a backend technology or a DevOps kind of technology. Part of a small team with the goal of being certified by a major BHS consultant to bid on BHS projects. What's BHS? Baggage handling system. Okay. So you do kind of spell that out and give me the term. So that's fine. Develop multiple applications used for maintenance diagnostics, conveyor control, storing, displaying operational data. Cool. Bag bag sortation decisions maybe bag sorting decisions sortation sounds like a weird word um it just kind of stands out as a little weird again explain like i'm five and tsa bag status inspection stations cool so yeah i would just change this sortation word to just be sorting uh collaborate with electrical engineers to interface with plcs programmable logic controllers running the baggage conveyors, the team achieved BHS certification after two years of testing and feedback. Great. This is really good impact. This is showing the impact of the project that you built. Um, but I think that this project actually belongs up above. The other thing that I'm noticing here, and, and some of you may have picked up on this. Oh, no, now it's behaving properly. Is when I was dragging earlier, it was kind of dragging things out of order. That's something that I tend to look for when I see a PDF file when I drag over this stuff, is it actually dragging from top to bottom? And this one actually is. That lets us know that the applicant tracking system is actually going to scan all the words properly on this. If you ever build a PDF file and you start to drag over top of this and then you start seeing it highlight down here and then as you continue to drag, that highlighting disappears and starts highlighting somewhere else, that means that whatever built your PDF file data in a really janky way, that applicant tracking systems are going to have a hard time parsing it. And so if that's happening to you and you're not getting phone calls, it's because your resume is messed up and the applicant tracking system doesn't know what to do with your resume and is probably tossing in the trash. Um, and so this, this one is formatting properly. So always check that when you, when you're building a PDF file, whatever is generating your PDF, you always want to drag from the top left corner and drag and highlight across the whole page. And if it ever looks like you see that highlighting kind of jump around and it's not highlighting things in the right order, then whatever built your PDF file did an awful job and you need to build your resume in some other tool so that it's actually going to get by an applicant tracking system. If you're ever unsure, jobscan.co. Jobscan.co. You can input your resume here, paste in the text of a job post, 
and it's going to tell you how well your resume lines up. And if it can't parse your resume properly, like it'll give you a score and it'll be like, your resume scores like 10%. That means it couldn't parse your resume properly. Or it could mean that just you didn't have the right kind of keywords for that job post. Um, overall though, I think this resume is pretty decent. I would just rearrange the skills. I would fill out the skills block a little bit more to kind of differentiate your front end skills and your back end skills for the kind of roles that you want to apply to. Um, so the notes that came with this are like, you know, am I sort of balancing these skills properly? If you're applying for front end roles, I don't think you need to tell me quite so much about all the industrial programming and stuff like that because it's not going to be applicable to most front end roles. It's neat to know. It's interesting to know. But you're putting an awful lot of like more than half of the page on technologies and tech stack that are not going to be important to companies that are doing front-end development or that are trying to hire for a front-end developer role. Yes, you have a degree in CS, and yes, you use that for seven years, and that is incredibly important to convey on a resume. I don't think you need to give me this many bullet points and this many like this much text about a project that you built related to that job if you're applying for a front-end role. If you're applying for a front-end role, your resume needs to scream loud and clear, I am a front-end developer. So if you're applying for a front-end developer role, let me show you how I'd rearrange this a little bit. I would rearrange the summary here to say, seven year experienced industrial control programmer, now front-end developer, focusing on user experience, user interface design, and making you know amazing uh, you know web interface designs or whatever, like figure out some way of wording that. From there, I would list your skills block, primarily highlighting your front end skills, and then put your your school projects on there, and then dive into your education and put your professional experience at the bottom with this professional project also as part of that professional experience. Because then top to bottom, your resume, that top half of the page is all front end technologies. The bottom half is still interesting, but now the bottom half is like the stuff that's not as important to that front end role. So I think you could break this resume into two different kinds of resumes depending on what kind of job you're going for. If you want to be more of that industrial type of programmer, where you know now you can build even better dashboards and and so on that that you did you know with uh, with the baggage handling and and some of the stuff that you were doing here where you're you know talking about building out the interface for you know these industrial types of computers now you can make those interfaces even better so you could combine those skills a little bit if you still want to do kind of that low level PLC you know industrial type of programming and still apply the work that you've done uh, through Turing. But if you went to Turing because you don't want to do that work anymore, then you need to rearrange your resume and just make that top half of the page focus entirely on being a front-end developer. Call yourself a front-end developer up here at the top. Your summary needs to say seven years professional experience with a degree, now doing front-end development, focusing on user interface, uh, user experience, following you know accessibility standards and, and so on and so on it needs to talk about you know i've this is what i used to be and now these are all the other things that i do as a front-end developer and then you need to list out that skills block primarily focusing on the front-end technologies and then get your front-end projects on there and then dive immediately into your education so they can so the progression is this is what i know this is where i've practiced it this is where i learned it and then they're going to see the CS degree, and then they're going to see your professional experience after that of how you used your CS degree for seven years. And so it kind of brings that back around to that uh, introduction of like, here's how I use that CS degree for seven years. But I think that's going to be an important way of like shifting things around depending on the kind of role that you want to go for. If you want to do more of this industrial programming type, I think your resume is pretty good. I would just move the skills block up to the top either way. The skills should go underneath your summary and this baggage handling project needs to be part of your actual professional experience here and then everything else on the page can stay the same if you want to do the industrial programming you want to be a front-end developer call yourself a front-end developer rewrite the summary and put all your front-end stuff first put your skills block put your front-end projects and then your education and then put your professional experience and this professional project down in the bottom half of the page overall Pretty good job on this.
Um, I think I think overall you did you did a, a pretty fine job on this resume. So good job. All right, well that's our resume review. Let's uh, let's give away let's give away a spool of filament, shall we? Um, so because we hit our thousand dollar goal last night, um, I wanted to give away two spools of filament. But in the distraction of like having a huge raid come in, uh, we never actually got around to giving away the, the second roll. So we're going to give away that second roll of filament right now. So exclamation point giveaway right here. Um, this spool of filament is sponsored by me. Uh, I'm going to give you coupon codes for Polymaker. Um, one coupon, co so you're going to get two coupon codes. The first coupon code will cover the cost of a spool of filament. The second coupon code should give you free shipping anywhere that Polymaker will ship their filament. If you do not want 3D printer filament, if you don't do 3D printing, if you get selected as the recipient, just say pass um, or re-roll. Just tell me to re-roll, and, and we'll go from there. Um, if, you, if you legitimately want a spool of 3D printer filament and you do 3D printing, then, uh, then feel free. By all means, you're, like, everyone's welcome to, to have this. Polymaker will ship pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll go for that. Now... As far as the other prizes that we added, um, I did add a cosplay helmet because we crushed that goal last night. So I said, when we hit $1,000, I'm gonna put a 3D printer on there. When we got to $1,500, I'm gonna put like a custom cosplay helmet. You get to choose the helmet. I'm gonna like print it and post process it to the point to where it can be painted. And then I'm gonna ship it to you. You can paint it. Or if you wanna commission me to paint it, I will paint it for you at an additional charge. But the helmet itself is gonna be free and shipping it to you will be free. Um, if you want me to paint it, I'll paint it. Otherwise, it's just going to be primed gray, and then you can paint it whatever color you want. Um, and it'll have a visor and the whole bit. I will need to work with you on, like, measuring your head, but those are the two new prizes that got added. Um, now, the helmet I will ship within North America. The printer, because it's coming from any cubic, they do have restrictions on where it can go. So it can go through the United States, uh, some places in Europe and Australia, but it cannot ship to Canada, unfortunately. It's just their restriction. Um, I can maybe see about maybe buying it from Amazon and see if Amazon will like ship it to Canada. Um, we'll work on that. So we'll figure out like who receives that. But it, keep in mind, it's an entry level 3D printer. It's not meant for people who are used to having like 500 to a thousand dollar printers and you've got a fleet of them this is not meant for you all right so i can't stop you from reserving your tokens for the 3d printer but my very strong hope is that that 3d printer is going to go to somebody who's new to 3d printing because it's meant to be an entry level like let's get you started with 3d printing so it's an any cubic cobra it's a great starter printer it's not going to be super high end but it will do auto bed leveling and all that kind of stuff so um yeah, well, it's funny because the Cobra 2 that they make will ship to Canada. It's like an extra 70 bucks. We'll see how we do with the giveaways. If we can get to like 1750, I'll upgrade the printer to the Cobra 2, which will ship to Canada, and then I'll, I'll change the description. Uh, but for right now, we're going to go with the Cobra, and for whatever reason, they won't ship that one to Canada. I don't know why. Maybe it's just a warehouse thing, but when you go look at the AnyCubic website, they just have a restriction right now that it won't. that one won't ship to Canada. Uh, but yeah, it seems really weird that they won't ship that to Canada. There, there are typically no export uh, controls on that kind of thing. Uh, I can see why it won't go to other countries, but for what's inside of it, I'm kind of surprised. Anyway, so let's do the filament giveaway right now. We're going to give away a spool of Polymaker filament. So I'll give everybody like a minute to do exclamation point giveaway. Uh, so at 48 minutes after the hour... I'm gonna go ahead and draw for that spool of polymaker filament. So give away daily polymaker filament. So I'm gonna so whoever receives this, um, if you can, do the exclamation point register command up here in the top corner, um, and that will give me your name and your address. Um, but for this, actually. You won't need to register for this one. You will need to send me a Twitch DM. My DMs are open. Send me a Twitch DM. And uh, I will send you back the coupon codes. And those coupon codes, again, one coupon code, uh, and you'll enter both of them on the payment page. So pick whatever spool of filament, go to the payment page, and then you're going to type in both coupon codes. One of them is going to make the filament free, and the other one's going to give you free shipping. <laughs> Reactor Tech, you're, you're flipping amazing. All right, we just upgraded to a Cobra 2. Thank you. 
Wow. Uh, that was not expected. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad this didn't happen last night or I'd be like eating a whole bunch more hot sauce. Um, but I will do the extra giveaway points. So let's, uh, let's do that. More hot sauce? No, the hot sauce got put away. Um, although I still do have the teaspoon, I could like lick the remainder hot sauce off of the teaspoon that sat out overnight and I'm sure is full of bacteria. Um, so let's do a give all 250. Um, we'll give everybody 250 points just for that. Thank you. Reactor tech, that means a lot. Um, the fact that the community is like really rallying around STEM to the future is fantastic for me. Um, sometime next week, so in about a week, we're gonna have Jacob on the stream. Uh, we need to figure out the exact day and the time, um, but Jacob, the founder of STEM to the Future, is gonna come on the stream and we're gonna have a conversation about it and everyone's welcome to come by and ask questions about the organization and what they do and their expansion plans and how they help out with schools and stuff like that. I would love to have everybody come by and, and ask Jacob questions and just show them the kind of love and support that you've all been really fantastic about over the last 24 hours alone. We've raised, about $1,300, you're blowing my mind here. Uh, absolutely fantastic, so thank you for that. And I'm also matching all of these funds. So initially, I, my expectation was you'd raise a thousand, I'd raise a thousand, that was our $2,000 goal, uh, but you're crushing it. So everybody, please thank Reactor Tech because Reactor Tech just upgraded the printer to a Cobra 2. Um, so thank you for that, appreciate it very, very much. Um, so I will make a mental note for myself Note to self, upgrade to a Cobra 2. All right, so everybody in Canada owes Reactor Tech a, a huge thank you for that. Um, so yeah, otherwise these are the, the short codes that you see over here. So like Resin, the Great Dragon, the Lego, the Flexi. Now we've got the 3D printer and we've got the helmet on there. So you'll be able to reserve tokens. So you can, you can choose to exchange however many points you want into tokens, reserve the tokens for the different prizes. Um, and if you do exclamation point points, it'll tell you you need to register. If you haven't already registered, it'll ask you to fill out a registration form. Um, and then when you do points, it'll try to pull over that registration form. And then, excuse me, it'll calculate however many points that you have. And then you can convert those into tokens if you choose. Any points that you don't convert into tokens will carry over into future giveaways. So you'll kind of have a head start on other people. Uh, the month of August, month of September, every time I stream and you come by, you'll also be gaining points and we'll do point giveaways and stuff like that as well. Um, hey, Dusty Knuckles. Um, cool. Well, let's, yeah, Dusty Knuckles got a boatload of points because uh, you were hanging out on the, on the stream last night and got tons and tons of giveaway points. So everybody that came and hung out on the two-year anniversary last night, plus Dusty Knuckles, I think you've been following me for a long time as well. So that gave you a bunch of points. Um, but yeah, you basically, you got boatload of points last night for sure. Um, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's do that filament giveaway right now. So exclamation point giveaway. I'm going to give everybody 15 more seconds in case anybody new came by. We're going to give away a spool of polymaker filament. I'm going to give you two coupon codes. One coupon code is for the filament to be free. The other coupon code is for free shipping anywhere that they ship filament. So I'll give you like another 10, 15 seconds. Exclamation point giveaway in chat. So you got the command right down here, exclamation point giveaway, type this in chat. And we will uh, we'll do that drawing in about five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, so Mojo, you need to go register and then it'll start calculating your points after that. All right, so here we go for the filament. And that person is Humbler John. Humbler John, um, if you do 3D printing, you're welcome to claim this um, if you're here. If you do not do 3D printing, just say pass, don't do claim, um, but just say pass. If you don't do 3D printing or you have no plans of getting into 3D printing, uh, then you don't have to claim the filament. But let me know if you are in chat, if you do want it, exclamation point claim. Uh, I'm hoping this timer will work if you claim the prize. The timer should shut off and it should say that you got your prize and the other commands should not be stopped. So you should still be able to do like Go get me the link to submit a resume review. So that's still working. So I got the whole asynchronous thing working again. Um, and it looks like Humbler John is not around. Womp womp. Got 10 seconds left. Humbler John, if you're around, we are going to redraw. So Mojo, yep. So go fill out that form for me. And then uh, once you fill out the form, come back. And if, if the points command still doesn't find your registration, try registered.
past tense and see if that'll copy it over. If that still doesn't work, uh, send me a direct message and we'll go from there. Um, cool. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's redraw because Humbler John did not answer. Digital Dragon, good to see you. RC, you got yourself a spool of filament. So exclamation point claim to claim your filament. And we do have one other giveaway to do today. Um, I do want to share some thoughts about like career development for people starting a new job and the kinds of things you can do. Let's see if it works. All right. We'll do another drum roll just to see whether the claim works. Hey, you worked and the timer went away. Look, Ma, no hands. Hooray. <laughs> All right. All right. We made, we made the thing work. Hooray. Um, Cool. So, yep, Dusty Knuckles. So, converted for 250 tokens. So, just throw the word confirm on the end of that, and uh, we should be good to go. Uh, why doesn't that button work? That one worked. Time. All right. I think the timers are a little off on my buttons. So, all right. Cool. Well, we got uh, we got folks doing the doing the points and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I pointed out the death survey results because they had some employment stuff that could be interesting, but the API thing is interesting. I saw something about related to AI. Apparently someone or some group made an API so people could interface with open AI, but it's not a good API. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. A lot of bad APIs out there. Uh, lots of dark patterns, other issues, but it's the only API at the time. So now open AI and others are catering to that API instead of exposing their functionality on their own. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate how many bad APIs there are out there. And working with Postman, you know, I, I, see, I see more bad APIs than I see good APIs. Um, and that's part of my job is to help educate people on, like, what makes a good API. So we'll, uh, we'll get there. Someday we'll get there. Maybe as we train the AI into how, to, how do I write a good API, um, I have a feeling the AI is going to be like, you should just follow the REST standard from back in like 2000 or 2002, like when the REST standard came out. Uh, it'll probably tell us to go back to that at some point or just write gRPC APIs. Those are, those are pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, all right, well, let's, um, let's dive in on those notes a little bit. And again, I want to, so I was, I was re, well, I was recording a new podcast with Scrimba. It's a, a programming boot camp over in the UK. And they asked me to come back on their podcast. So I'm the first, I'm the first person that they've asked to return to the podcast, which was a really nice feeling. And then at the end of that episode, we're like, we should do a part three. So we're probably going to come up with other topics as well. Um, but they may take some time to like rotate through other guests and stuff like that. But it was nice to come back. The, the whole theme of that podcast was when you start a new job, what, what kinds of like top skills and actions should you kind of take part in as an entry level developer starting a new job? I think some of these things are going to apply for any level as you start a new job, uh, but some of these are, are going to be pretty clearly specific to entry level type of roles. Um, and so I'm going to kind of share some of my thoughts of, of what I was talking about, but also why and the impact, because some of it is extra work. And I think that it's important to say, well, you know, you start this new job, you've already, you know, you're already going to feel overwhelmed because now you've got a professional job as a programmer and you're going to feel this enormous pressure mostly on yourself, but you're going to feel this pressure to contribute. Um, and now here's this guy telling you, you got to go do all this other stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about why I'm suggesting that these are things to do. Um, and on the Scrimba podcast, we talked about things like, you know, you need to learn how to be a good listener because you don't know what you don't know and you need to be able to ask good questions. And the best way to do that is to just absorb as much as you can. Um, and we also talked a little bit about like, don't try to rush your onboarding. Uh, you're gonna be learning a lot. And part of your contribution, especially as an entry level dev is that you are learning things and you're gonna learn by asking questions and you're gonna ask better questions by being a good listener. So there's kind of like, be a good listener, ask good questions and learn, and that's how you're contributing to starting off on that job. But I've, I've got like a list of other things um, that I'd love to share. And again, some of these are gonna be applicable no matter what level you are. Um, hey, Kenja, thank you for the two years, appreciate that. 
Um, so the first one that I've got on, uh, so Dusty Knuckles, again, my, my strong hope, because I know you do 3D printing, my strong hope is that people that are going to try to get the 3D printer are new to 3D printing. I can't stop you. You've already reserved those tokens, but please know that that is my hope, that whoever gets that 3D printer is like new to 3D printing because it is bare bones entry level. It is not meant to be like a really high level kind of printer. It's it's an entry level printer, just FYI, so you're aware of that. Um, so the first tip that I've got is ask questions all the time, but document what you get told. The thing to do here is, again, by being a good listener and, and paying attention to the kinds of things that they want you to learn, if you're writing down the answers, a couple things are going to happen. One, you're less likely to ask that question a second time. Two, you're documenting everything and you're engaging the other part of your brain by writing things down. Um, but then you're also, now you've got documentation. So if you're ever curious about something, you've got notes that you can go back to. If you contribute those notes back to the team, everybody's got the, those things. But the, the key thing here is when you're documenting that stuff is go back to the person that gave you that answer and say, hey, RC Maniac, when I asked you that question and you told me such and such, this is how I kind of wrote it down in my notes. Can you just glance over this real quick and tell me whether I did that accurately? Is this an accurate thing? Or, you know, go ask someone else on the team and don't say, hey, RC Maniac told me this thing. Is that accurate? You can just say like, hey, I had a question about this and this is what I've been told. Is this a good way of explaining it? Is this a, an accurate way of describing, you know, how these systems work or how the software got written or the background on it? Um, because it's important that you get that double check for accuracy. That it has it has a couple of reasons why. The first one, you're going to grow a lot faster at the organization if you're writing down notes like that. You're less likely to ask questions a second time. But then people also know that when you're asking a question, they're giving you an answer, that you're doing something with that answer. And so you're less likely to ask the same question again. Um, you're also helping the team grow because now the next person that they hire is going to have access to your notes and now you're you're making everybody better. Um, it is a little bit of extra work, but by writing this stuff down, you're really helping your own growth anyway, and you're going to feel like you're contributing back later on when you have questions about why are we doing things the way that we do, why do we write that code the way that we do, or how do I do this part properly, because you're going to have good notes about that kind of stuff. You're going to stand out as somebody who understands all these different systems and how they communicate, and you're going to have the context of why things were built the way they were. Um, RC Maniac asks, what if they all quit? Well, I mean, if, if they quit after they give you the answers, then you don't have to worry so much about it because you've already got it documented. If they quit before you can ask them those questions, then the company's in a bad spot and it's not your fault if you have to kind of stumble around and find out and figure out your own answers. But if the company is letting all the senior people leave without really trying hard to keep them there and they end up with a brain drain, they shouldn't be hiring entry-level devs anyway. They need people that can come in and look at the code and understand what the code is doing as opposed to an entry-level developer who's going to have a much harder time. They're going to be able to read the code and they're going to be able to understand like, okay, this is what the code is doing, but they're not going to have the context of why. Like, why did this get built the way that it does? How does this system contribute to other systems? Um, that's going to be a little bit harder. So that's a company issue. If My hope here with this idea is, you know, as you're asking other people questions and you're documenting it, like you want to turn around within a day and say like, hey, can you just double check this for accuracy? You're not going to have to do that every time. Eventually people are going to trust like, hey, yeah, when I give you that answer, you're writing it down properly. And then if you can share those notes with the team, now documentation tends to go out of date very, very quickly because systems are constantly changing. You're constantly building new things, you're adding new features, or you're changing how something works. So somebody somewhere is going to have to keep that up to date. Um, if it does get stale, then maybe the new person coming in can look at the old notes and go, well, it doesn't quite work that way. Why doesn't it work this way anymore? And then they can document why it changed from the way that it was. But again, you've still got better documentation overall, and you're kind of tracking this contextual history of why it was built the way that it was and why it got changed. So it just makes the team better overall because you're all sharing collective knowledge and nobody's like a silo of knowledge. The second point that I want to share here is letting everybody on your team know that you want feedback. 
this is extremely important. And I think this is important no matter what level you are coming in. Um, and, and same thing with asking questions and documenting things. You can certainly do that at a more senior level as well. By letting the team know that you want feedback, you're actively asking for that feedback. At the end of every sprint, every work cycle, after every project, you're saying like, hey, can I get some feedback on my performance or on this feature that I wrote? Like, did I follow good standards? Did I write the code well that it can be extended? Like, did I do an okay job on that? That's going to help you in a number of ways. One, you're going to have notes about your feedback uh, from other people, and it's also going to help you list your accomplishments. So you want to keep track of that data somewhere, not on a work machine. So I typically tell people when you're, you know, build out that really long resume of all your skills, all your accomplishments, it's going to go on that really long resume that you're storing somewhere else on the internet or on your personal computer. Um, ideally, you're backing it up in the cloud somewhere. But keep like any any time you're working on a new project, a new feature, if the more you can understand about the impact of what you built, put those impact statements on your resume. And if you're actively ask, asking for that feedback all the time, you're going to have a very rich history of like, these are all the things that I was a part of at that company. And then when you go to apply for a new job later on, you've already got all these notes on your resume that you can then condense down into what's going to be important for that job or that job. You'll have a better idea of which bullet points to keep on the resume as you apply for these other jobs. So you want to ask for feedback on a regular basis. You want to let them know like, hey, you know what, I would prefer that, you know, any sort of critical feedback, that I would prefer that to be done in private. Um, and then if you're not like a big public pat me on the back kind of person, then you can say, you know what, if you've got good feedback, I would also appreciate that in private. Me personally, I'm not generally a spotlight like, you know, hey, everybody, look what Ian built and Ian's amazing and everybody clap for Ian like that. Like, I don't like that personally. And so I usually tell people like, hey, if you're happy about something that I did, I would love to hear it. If there's something that you would like to see me change, I would also love to hear it. By actively telling everyone on your team on a regular basis, I really want feedback. They're going to feel a lot less awkward about giving you feedback. And as long as you're reacting appropriately to their feedback, they're going to know that when they give you feedback that you're going to handle it well. You're going to handle it respectfully and like an adult. Um, and then, you know, you can also kind of ask them about the overall impact of like, Hey, that feature that I built, like how fast is that? Is that better? Like when I, when I fixed that bug, did it make the code any faster? How much faster did it make it? Can you help me benchmark, you know, like, Hey, when we updated that system and, you know, we think we reduced the time, can we actually see how much that changed? Because now on your resume, instead of just saying, I improved this code, you can say, Hey, I improved this code and it made it faster by 20%, or it reduced the code base by 10%. That's a better impact statement on the resume than just, I helped improve some code, or I helped you know rewrite this system. It's like, okay, well, you did the thing, but the more that your resume can show like the impact that you had when you did that thing, the better. And you're gonna get a lot of that by telling your team that you want feedback. So when I started this last job, like a year and a half ago at Postman, I made sure to tell everybody on my team as I'm going around, it's like, hey, let's do a quick Zoom call and introduce and like have the whole like, you know, back and forth kind of conversation. I was always really upfront and be like, hey, anytime you ever have something to tell me, please know I'm open to feedback, good or bad. You can absolutely come to me and give me that feedback. I've got thick skin. I've been doing this for a long time. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, but I really, I value that feedback. I, I enjoy the idea of iterative improvement. I constantly want to tweak the knobs and dials to make myself better so I can help make the team better. And I'm only going to do that if you can give me feedback. And so I'm going to ask you for feedback on a regular basis, but also know if you ever have feedback for me that you can give me that feedback at any time. Overall, people are going to feel a lot less awkward about like, oh, I want to tell RC about that thing that didn't really work very well. Like, how do I tiptoe around it? If they know that you're open to feedback, they can just come to you and be like, hey, RC, can we chat about that feature? Here's what you built. This is what we see about it, you know, and so on and so on. It's going to also give you better answers for behavioral questions that you get in interviews about what was the impact that you had. Tell me about a time you worked on a team and something didn't work out well. You're going to have better answers for those behavioral questions. So actively ask for feedback. Let your team know as soon as you start that job. Let the team know you want feedback. You really value getting that feedback from them. 
Uh, Kenja is asking, any tips on introducing yourself when meeting new coworkers virtually and in person? Um, try not to do it in a giant group. Like, don't walk into a whole group of people and be like, hi, everybody, I'm Ian. You know, let me go around the room and ask each one of them. Just say, like, hey, I'm Ian. I'd love to connect with each one of you individually. And that way you can kind of, like, make your own notes. And it feels a little more personal where you're, like, meeting people. And, you know, I mean, obviously doing, like, a big group introduction of, like, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so. You're probably going to forget a lot of their names anyway. Um, and so the more you can do it on an individual basis, at least for me, I find that's better from my memory of remembering who they are and what kind of role they have and where they fit in on the org. Um, because I work 100% remote, I'll typically have, like, our org chart up. So when they introduce themselves, I can kind of see like, oh, who do they answer to? How does that relate to my job? You know, are we both on the same overall team? Are you in a completely different team? Like, how does that impact what I do? Like, if you change something on your team, how does that impact me and my role? Um, you can kind of make those connections like in your head. You can make those connections a little bit easier. So for me, I like to meet people one on one. Um, everyone's a little different, though, if you're kind of the, the social, like outgoing type. I'm, I'm right on the border of introvert, extrovert. I'm what they call an ambivert. I can go either way. It's like being ambidextrous, you know, where you can use both hands. I'm both an introvert and an extrovert. I appreciate my alone time, but I also really enjoy being around other people. Um, but sometimes I get exhausted being around other people and I need my alone time to kind of recharge. Sometimes I recharge by being around people and I can kind of feed off that energy a little bit. And so I kind of go back and forth a little bit. Everyone's a little different. So it's not really just introvert, just extrovert. It's actually, uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, it's kind of a spectrum. It's a little bit like a spectrum. Third point, find a mentor. When you start a job, you need to find somebody that can mentor you and kind of show you the ropes. This one is, is especially important for people that are new in the tech industry. You need to find someone uh, who can kind of check over your notes for accuracy, kind of help you connect the dots and figure out how different things work. Um, and then part of, part of, you know, trying to find that mentor and introducing yourself around to other people, you're also going to figure out, okay, who's the respectful type of person? Who's the helpful kind of person? Who's the kind of condescending person that I'd really rather not talk to uh, that makes me feel like they don't have time for me? Um, those are the people you generally want to avoid. And then the people that you really enjoy and actively talk to that are willing to teach you things and take that time of like, oh, you know what, let me drop everything I'm doing. I want to explore that with you. Let me tell you all that stuff and like dump my brain into your brain. You want, you want people who are excited to help you learn and grow. You want them to be your mentor. Sometimes they can be hard to find. So you might have to, you know, talk to a lot of different people. But as you, as you kind of work at the company, you're going you're gonna to find a good mentor within the company that you can learn from and grow, no matter what level you are, but especially as an entry-level developer. You want to ask them for regular sort of check-in meetings. Not that it's a one-on-one, -on -one, but that you can kind of shadow them and say like, hey, I got a little bit of downtime this afternoon. Can I hop on a Zoom call where you share your screen? I can just kind of watch you work and you can kind of explain what you're doing. Because again, getting the why behind what they're doing is important. And we kind of talked about that even when I was discussing like going over this list. Understanding the context behind something is probably the most beneficial thing to your growth at a company. You want to maintain that friendship with that person even outside of the company. If, if they leave or if you leave, you want to stay connected with that person because that's an important person. If they're, if they're treating you respectfully and they're helping you learn and grow, you want them to keep doing that no matter where they go or wherever you go. If they stay at the company and you leave, or if you stay at the company and they leave, or maybe you both leave, you want to maintain that professional sort of working relationship with them. The other important thing here around finding a mentor is finding a mentor outside of the company. Now you have to make sure that you're respecting any non-disclosure agreements and privacy agreements and things like that, but it's good to have a mentor outside of the company as well where I could hit up RC Maniac, for example, and say, hey, RC, I'm having some problems with this code. I'm trying to abstract this thing with a database. And man, the, the ORMs is not working the way that I thought. Like, you know, I know that you work in the same programming language as me. Do you have any tips? You know, or have you had a thing where like the ORM works, but it's kind of slow? Like, do you have any tips on optimizing an ORM call? I can't really show you the code, but you know, can I kind of generally describe what I'm doing and kind of get your input? Um, Part of having an external mentor that's really helpful is it kind of helps you avoid tunnel vision. And this is especially important when you're new in the industry 
Because when you're new in the industry and you start that job, you kind of build this mindset of like, this is the only way to do a thing. Like, this is how we do this thing. And this is the only way to do this thing. Because you're like, that's all you're learning. That's all you know. And it's really easy to kind of get into this mindset of like, this is the only way we program this thing. By having an external mentor, it can kind of help you realize like, no, there's more than one way to do a thing. Like, think about this, think about that, look at it from this angle, look at it from that angle. And sometimes just asking someone outside the company a very abstracted question about like, hey, I'm really stuck on this performance, you know, of such and such. Uh, I'm not really sure what to do. And they say, oh, try this or try this or try this. And you're like, oh, okay. And now because they have to look at it from a different angle because they don't have all the context because you, you know, you have privacy agreements and whatever that you have to, uh, you know, you have to respect they have to look at it from a different angle than you are because you can't give them all the context and the why because that that phone call is just going to take forever if you have to explain everything to them. But if you can kind of abstract the problem down into like a little nugget and now they've got to look at it from a different angle, that helps you look at it from a different angle as well. And that might give you some ideas about how to go solve problems. This also gives you someone outside the organization, again, just uh, not just for that perspective, but also for external motivation. One of the things that, that happens a lot in our industry is you kind of feel beat up and defeated a little bit of like, oh, I'm still trying to fix that bug. I'm still running into a problem with that bug. I'm having a really hard time like solving this thing or figuring this thing out. When you have that external mentor, then you've got someone else be like, remember this thing that you built and this other thing that you did and all this other stuff? Like, you're going to figure this out. You're going to be fine. Like right now it's hard, you're in the weeds and you know, it feels like you're trudging through mud, but you're gonna get through it. Think about all the other things that you've built. You worked on this, you worked on this, you worked on this, you were able to figure all those things out. You're gonna figure this out too. How can I help? So by having that mentor outside of the company, it can also really help with that motivation. Having the internal mentor within the company, you can certainly get that motivation as well. You're gonna get a lot more motivation, I think, from having an external mentor as well that can just kind of be that cheerleader. Uh, maybe not, you know, rah, rah, you know, go, go, uh, Kinja Sloth, go, like you can do the thing. But sometimes they're gonna remember the good points that you don't remember because you're feeling awkward or you're feeling beat up or you feel like you're not contributing enough or contributing at all or it's like man i feel like i didn't get any work done this past week i was struggling with this and i was struggling with motivation or you know blah 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 and they can help kind of keep you going so i think it's important to find mentors inside the company but also outside of the company just for perspective again please respect your non-disclosure agreements and privacy agreements within your company that you're not like showing other people, you know, code or data or anything like that that's going to get you into trouble. Don't do that. But sometimes you do need help from outside because, again, I think having that different perspective can help you solve problems a little bit quicker. Or you can go back to your team and be like, hey, I figured this thing out, but what if we looked at it from this angle? And you can say, like, I was talking to my mentor. I abstracted kind of the problem that we were having. And, you know, they suggested, you know, what if we look at this or that? Is that a possibility? Well, bring that to your internal mentor. And then they can kind of bounce that or say, or maybe they come back and say, yeah, we actually tried it that way and it didn't work and that's why we're doing it this other way. But at least shows them that you're trying to learn and grow and think about things from different perspectives. And again, I think that that's an important aspect of being a good developer. You're showing that growth and, and taking responsibility for your own learning and so on. Um, kind of part in parcel with that is being open-minded. And again, that comes from learning different perspectives. Every company does work a little bit differently. How they do their projects are gonna happen a little bit differently. The process you follow is gonna change, but also the technologies that we use change over time as well. And I think that it's important not to, uh, not to really hold on to a particular tech stack for too long. I've actually coached people where they're like, you know, I learned this tech stack and I want to find a job in that tech stack. And my next job is also going to be that tech stack. And the next job is also going to be that tech stack. It's like, well, now you're, you're kind of living in the past. Like you need to progress your skills 
Otherwise, your resume is just going to look like you're doing the same thing year over year over year because you're not even upgrading like the versions of things like, oh, I use Rails 5 to build this project. And because I was really familiar with that, I wrote the next one in Rails 5 and the next one in Rails 5. It's like, well, we're, I think we're up to Rails 7 now. Like, why aren't you on the latest and greatest? Why aren't you learning the newer versions of things at least? But as, as hiring managers and, and so on, we also want to see that you're progressing in the type of work that you're doing, um, that you're not just holding on to a single programming language. Like, okay, cool, you know a lot about Ruby, you've been doing that for a long time, but like, are you exploring other things? It's kind of that, that old saying of like, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's like, the only thing I know is Python and Django. And so every problem I try to solve, I want to use Python and Django because that's the only technology I know. And I think that that's going to hold you back in your career. So being open-minded about learning new technologies and so on, I think being excited about that because the only constant in technology is that the technology is going to change. That's the only constant. The only thing that stays the same is the fact that everything is going to change. You never learn one skill and that's the only way you do it forever. You're never going to learn one programming language, and that's the only programming language you're ever going to use, ever, ever, ever. You have to be really open-minded to, okay, this company, their process is a little bit different. They do Agile a little bit different, or Scrum, or Kanban, or whatever. Like, maybe that's going to change company to company. Even within the company, they could change, you know, it's, you know what, that process didn't really work. Let's try this. We're going to try that for six months. Nah, that didn't really work either. Let's switch over to this one for six months and see where that goes. You just, you have to roll with it things are going to change. Staying up on trends can be really important. That will also help with making suggestions about exploring new things and new ways of doing things. I think that's going to be really important as well because technology is constantly changing. The way that I started writing code, so I've been in the industry now for 27 years, the way I wrote code 27 years ago is completely different than how we write code now. It's completely different. Some of the programming languages are still the same. People are still using C and C++ and like the lower level things. I'm sure there are people out there still writing assembly level code, which I did 27 years ago. I don't anymore. Now I'm using more high level languages. I do dip into lower level languages when I need the speed and performance. For example, my chatbot is running decently now on Python, but I want to move it into C Sharp so it'll be even faster. So I've got to go learn C Sharp. And I'm excited about it. It's, you know, I like, I like typed languages, so I want to get back into, into strongly typed languages and learning about, oh, yeah, this is how to do these things. And now I've got to learn how to do, you know, strong JSON, you know, encoding and decoding and, and or serialization, deserialization uh, in C Sharp. And what does that need? You know, do I use the Newtonsoft library? Do I try to figure out which version in the .NET library to use? Like... Or do I go learn both and then make a decision on which one I want to use going forward? Like, there's lots of different ways of doing things. And so I think you have to be excited about things are going to change. It's okay to change. What you don't want to do is you don't want to feel so distracted by trying to learn all the things. Of like, I got to go learn this and 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 this. Because then you feel very overwhelmed with how much there is to learn. And this is especially important early in your career it's going to feel very overwhelming for all the things that you want to go learn. And so I'd say keep your focus a little bit smaller, especially earlier in your career. You want to go really deep on your knowledge on fewer things. Otherwise, you have a very shallow knowledge in a lot of things. But companies are going to hire you for the depth of knowledge in certain things. So they're going to hire you for depth, not width of the knowledge. So there's something that we call being a T-shaped engineer. And that's kind of the, the breadth of knowledge and their depth of knowledge. So the more breadth of knowledge, it can be helpful later on in your career where you want to be a generalist and you have multiple programming languages. But early in your career, you need that depth. You need to know something really deeply. And so become an expert in whatever technology you're using on that job. Become an expert in that thing. Worry less about the breadth of knowledge and focus more on your depth of knowledge at that job. That's going to serve you better earlier in your career. Later on in your career, you're going to be able to take that depth of knowledge as you learn other breadth, and you're going to be able to shift that knowledge over to something else. 
So if you know Python and Django really, really, really well, and then later on you want to shift that over to Ruby on Rails or Python or uh, JavaScript and Node or something like that, you're going to be able to shift more of that knowledge because you've, you've learned more depth of how that thing works. Now, not every framework is exactly the same. Not every language is exactly the same. But kind of the high-level ideas of abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance patterns, like all those, all those patterns, you're going to be able to shift those as you learn something else. So as you, over your career, as you kind of start to explore that breadth of knowledge, the deeper you have that knowledge in something else, the more you're going to be able to shift that knowledge into some other technology. But if, you're, if your overall knowledge stays really shallow, then you have less that you can actually go from one technology into another. If all you ever build is a to-do list app, and you'll be like, okay, now I'm going to go, like, I learned how to do that in JavaScript. Now I'm going to go learn how to do it in Python. I'm going to build the same to-do list app. And now I'm going to do that in Ruby. Now I'm going to do that in Go. Now I'm going to go do that in Rust. And now I'm going to go do that in TypeScript. And now I'm going to go do it in blah, blah, blah. The only thing you ever know how to build is a to-do list app. And so, yeah, you're going to learn kind of some of the ins and outs of a programming language, and you're going to learn a little bit of how a framework works, but that's the only kind of app that you're building. Again, you're not going as deep as possible because you're, you're learning a limited set of instructions to go solve a problem, and so you've got a, a much more shallow amount of knowledge that you can then kind of shift into something else. So the deeper you can go on something, the easier you're gonna be able to shift all of that knowledge into something else later on in your career. But earlier in your career, focus less on the breadth of knowledge. Like I wanna go learn Python and Go and Rust and AI and machine learning and data science and this and this and this and this and this. Don't worry so much about the breadth of knowledge. Focus on fewer things and get that depth of knowledge instead. That's gonna serve you so much better in your career. But you do need to be open-minded about learning other technologies and other ways of doing things, even if it's within the depth of, okay, I learned how to do these things in the framework. How do I do these things in that framework? How do I do these things in that framework? How do I do these things in that framework? And that depth of knowledge just got deeper and deeper and deeper. And now you can apply all of that knowledge into the next framework that you go learn. So to kind of recap all this stuff, how does this help you become a, a really good engineer? So you're going to grow into the kind of engineer that really embodies all of these skills. You're going to help new hires come on the team because you're keeping notes and you're going to show them where those notes are and you're going to collaborate on those things. And you're going to make the team better because you're sharing your knowledge. And be, when other people share their knowledge with you, you're turning around, you're sharing that knowledge with other people. You're going to make a whole team better. You can then, as you grow in your career, you're going to be in a better position to be that mentor to other people. You don't, you don't necessarily want to volunteer to be a mentor. You always want to be asked to be a mentor. Um, but you can actively talk about how you have a mentor, and that'll encourage other people of like, oh, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to like go reach out to other people. It's like, hey, you know, you seem to know a lot about this thing. Can we also talk a little bit about that as well? Um, and, you know, would you be willing to mentor me? I've had people actively reach out to me and say, will you mentor me? And I'd be like, okay, well, tell me about this, tell me about this, tell me about this. And we kind of have a quick conversation. I was like, okay, I'll mentor you. Here are my expectations. And then I never hear back from the person. Does that mean my expectations were too, too big for them? I don't think so, because I need to protect my time, because I don't have endless time to mentor everybody that I want to mentor. But if you're not willing to put in the work and put in the energy, then why am I going to be your mentor? If I'm going to give you things to do and you don't do them, then I'm going to stop being your mentor anyway. Um, but by doing all these things, you're going to grow into the kind of developer that other people want to be around. As you're kind of learning other technologies and you're exploring other technologies and you're making yourself better and you're making other people around you better, other people are going to want to work with you. When you leave that company and you go to some other company, people are going to want to follow you to that company because they want to keep working with you. When your managers see the kind of impact that you've had at that job, if your manager leaves and go to some other company, don't be surprised when they call you up and be like, hey, RC Maniac, I know that you've been really happy over there. I remember all the impact that you had. I'm working over here now. I would love to have you come work on the team over here because I understand how you work and how you work with the team and how you make everybody around you better. I want you to come do that over here. You're going to find that the, the leaders that you're following 
as they leave, they're going to want to bring you with them. I've had opportunity in my career to work with a handful of people at multiple jobs. And hands down, I can think of three names off the top of my head that I would absolutely drop of a hat. I would go work with them if there was a good opportunity um, and, you know, everything was lining up with my career goals and where they were working. And, you know, I kind of researched the company and be like, yeah, I want to go work there because that person is there. Um, I've done that several times. And I would absolutely do that again for those three people because I really liked working with those three people. If you're listening to this, you know who you are. If you're wondering if it's you, it's probably not you. <laughs> because I actively tell those people, I would absolutely work with you again. Like I would absolutely love to like find a way to like work with you at another opportunity. Um, but by embodying all of these skills and like how to be a good developer and make the other people around you better, you're going to find that other people want to be around you. And, you know, don't be surprised that they ask you to be a mentor. Don't be surprised that they ask you for help and you're going to help them grow. That's going to help you continue to learn and grow as well. Everybody's going to get better. It's kind of that saying like the rising tide lifts all boats, right? When you get better and you help other people, they get better and you also get better. Everyone around you is going to get better. And so be, be the kind of developer you want to be around. When I got into management, I got told by several people that were my direct reports, like, you're the best manager I've ever had. And I'm like, that's because I'm modeling what I am as a manager from what I wish I had had as a manager. I have like two examples over my whole career of 27 years. I have two managers that really stand out in my head, one especially, that were exceptional managers like exceptional managers. If I had, like, if I still lived in LA and this guy named Hugh was still, you know, working in the industry and had a job, I would absolutely go work at that job to work under this person because Hugh was an amazing manager and I would love to go work under them again. You're, you're going to find those kinds of people that you absolutely want to drop everything and like go work with those people again. And so when I modeled what I wanted to be as a manager, I thought of all the bad managers I had and what they didn't do well. And I thought of what Hugh did and what Hugh did really well, plus one other manager that was kind of in between. And I'm like, this is the kind of manager I want to be. And a lot of the times it's because that's the kind of manager I wished I had had. And, and I think that that's an important part of being a developer. So as you grow into your career, you can kind of model who you are and what you want to be based on who's around you and what you wish you had. Then you can say, you know what? I wish I had a better mentor that knew these things. Well, go learn those things and then be that mentor to somebody else because they probably need that too. It's going to make the whole industry better as we share these ideas and as we kind of grow and learn. It's going to make everybody better. Anyway, those were the points. That's going to be on a podcast coming out. I don't know when that podcast is going to come out with Scrimba. Um, but these were a lot of the points that we were kind of talking about. And I think they're going to actually split our conversation. <laughs> it's one of those things where it was supposed to be like a 40-minute conversation. And like an hour and a half later, we're like, we should probably wrap this up. Um, and they're like, yeah, we're probably going to have to break this into like several episodes because these are all like really good little nuggets of knowledge. And it's going to be too much for one giant episode. Um, so I think they're going to break it up into like five or six pieces and like roll them out as smaller podcasts. Um, but those are kind of the main points that I kind of wanted to share of like, they asked me to put some notes together on like, what should I do when I get a new job? Anyway, hope that's helpful to somebody. Um, Ash Prince says, it's great if you can scale in companies. That's normally a good sign yeah, for sure. Uh, you can learn how to not be a good, or you can learn how not to be a manager too. It's helped you model. Yeah, exactly. So as you, as you learn about like who's good in your career and who's bad in your career, you can kind of model around like, who do I want to have around me? Who are the kind of people that I want to have around me? You know, or what kind of person do I wish was around me? And then become that person because somebody else probably needs that too. Cool. So I hope that that's helpful to somebody. Hopefully. Um, all right, we got one more giveaway to do for the day. Uh, we gave away a spool of filament. Um, actually, RC, did you claim that spool of filament? Yeah, you did claim it, right? 
I forget now because I kind of rambled on for a really long time there. Did you actually claim that filament? Uh, we still have one more giveaway, so ignore the thing that says we've already chosen. Yeah, you did claim it. That's right. Um, so we do have one more thing that we're going to give away today. Uh, last night we gave away a ton of stuff, like tons and tons of stuff. And I, again, I really appreciate all the support. Um, yesterday we started the stream, we had only raised $483. We're up to $1,750 now for STEM to the future. Um, and so because we hit the thousand dollar goal, I added a 3d printer. When we got to $1,500, I added a cosplay helmet that I'm going to print and like post process to the point where it can be painted. Um, so I've added those as prizes. I think if we get to 2000, I'm going to find something else big and fun to put on the prize list. We'll see how that goes. Um, I don't know what that's going to be because I'm running out of ideas because I wasn't expecting you all to, to do this. Um, so we'll, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep going. <laughs> we'll find something else to put on there. Um, maybe I'll do like a second helmet or something. I don't know. We'll figure, we'll figure that out. When it comes to the big prizes, you can only win one of the big prizes, by the way. Um, you can still reserve your tokens. So if you don't win the 3d printer, you're still in for the running on other things. But if you win the cosplay helmet, then you're out of the running for the other things. Um, I've stipulated that in the giveaway thing on our discord community. Um, but you can still absolutely convert your points to tokens and reserve those tokens for all the different prizes and whatever kind of ratios you want. Again, the, the printer, uh, because we had another donation come in, we hit 1750. Uh, I'm going to upgrade the printer to an AnyCubic Cobra 2, which will ship to Canada, uh, where the Cobra 1 will not ship to Canada for whatever reason, AnyCubic's being weird that way. Um, and so we're going to give away a printer. And my very strong hope is that that printer goes to somebody who is not yet into 3D printing. I can't stop you from reserving your tokens, and whoever wins it, wins it. But my hope is that it goes to somebody who's not into 3D printing. Um, that's my very, very strong hope. But um, AnyCubic has a, a restriction on where they can send that kind of technology. Um, so the Cobra 2 will go to the US, Canada. Um, I was actually looking it up a minute ago. I don't know if I still have that browser open. Let me go see if I still have that open. So let's go over to the browser source over here and, and take a look. So this is the Anacubic Cobra 2. So this will be the 3D printer that we're going to add. So it will ship to the United States, Australia. I think that's Denmark. Overall, the EU, the UK, and Canada. If you're other, they may have other restrictions. So you can absolutely do exclamation point register. Tell me the country. We'll try to figure something out. Um, there may still be restrictions on where this can be shipped. So even if you're outside of these areas, uh, there may still be restrictions. Um, I'm going to buy the one without any filament. And so if you win the printer, you will be responsible for finding your own filament. Um, but uh, this will be a pretty decent entry-level uh, 3D printer. Again, I'm not going super high-end. I'm not buying anybody a bamboo or anything like that. But this will be a really good printer to get started with 3D printing. It does auto bed level auto bed leveling it's a decent size to get started with stuff it won't be big enough to do like cosplay helmets but it'll be a really decent sized printer um, and again my very strong hope is that it's going to go to somebody who's new to 3d printing because it is entry level it's not meant to be like you know super you know feature rich but it's going to be a decent size um, yeah so that's the printer that we're going to go with. So that got added. And then the cosplay helmet. I'm going to get all the other helmets that I have up on cool3dthings.com. Cool3dthings.com. So this is the website that I have eventually. There we go. Um, 3D printing items. Um, I, only have, I only have the Daredevil cowl and the Batman Arkham armor on there, but I've got a set of Iron Man armor that I'm going to get on here, and I've got a boatload of helmets. I kind of went through the list with everybody last night on the stream, um, and I've got screenshots of all of them. I just need the time to, like, get them up on the website, but you, basically, whoever wins the cosplay helmet, you're going to have your choice of cosplay helmet, and you'll be able to say, I want this one, and then we'll talk about how to measure your head. Send me those things. I might have you do, like, a photogrammetry of your head where, like, someone just takes pictures, like, all around your head using the 3D scanner apps that you can get on cell phones and, like, do a, a 3D scan of your head so I have an idea of, like, how big your melon is, and then I'll adjust the, the helmet appropriately, and then you get what you get. So, um, 
so yeah, that'll be, I'll get, I'll get those helmets on there eventually. Right now, all I have is the, the flexi dragon and the gray dragon and the gray dragon will depend on how big you want it and whether you want it airbrushed and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, but otherwise like obviously a full set of cosplay armor is going to be pretty spendy because it's like 20 spools of filament to, uh, on average to print off a, uh, a full suit of, uh, cosplay armor. Um, anyway. So that's kind of where we're at as far as those prizes. So those two things got added onto our list because we crushed those goals. So thank you again to everybody who helped contribute last night on the two year stream anniversary. Been doing this two years now, two years in a day. Uh, really happy to kind of help people out. Again, I hope those notes that I shared today were really helpful. I'm gonna give away a coupon code right now for my site. So I've also got tons of laser engraving and stuff on there. Or if you just want to hold on to that coupon code so that when I do add the other helmets and whatever, you can go in and you can like apply it to a cosplay helmet if you want. Um, now the price range differs based on whether you want me to do any amount of post-processing or if you just want it raw off the printer where I remove the support material and put it in a box. Or if you want me to like sand it and, you know, prime it and stuff like that. There's different price points for all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to give away a coupon code um, for the website. And that's going to be our next giveaway. So if you if you want something off the website, we're going to do that right now. Um, there's tons of laser engraving stuff on there. I've got slate coasters, um, all that kind of stuff. And I do package those up. And the coupon code uh, that I'm going to give you is going to be for about 15 bucks. So depending on what you buy, you can probably get like a couple of laser engraving signs plus the shipping. You might get one coaster plus the shipping. Um, that'll depend on what you want to order um, and where it's going. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that kind of as we go. Um, Chewy, thank you for that. Yeah, the, the whole idea of like sharing those ideas of like, this is how you're going to stand out when you get a new job, especially like asking for feedback and like taking notes and things like that. Like it is extra work on top of, you know, I'm trying to be a programmer. I'm trying to learn all the things. or I'm trying to learn how this company does this thing. Um, but the, but it really does help stand out. And if you can turn around and say like, Hey, what kind of, you know, when you're going in and like negotiating that one year anniversary raise, for example, you can be like, here's the impact I had. Here's all the projects. Here's the impact that I had in each of these projects. Um, being able to share that impact with your boss, as opposed to just, I did this, I did this, I did this. They were like, yeah, we know you did all those things. Okay, cool. You did the thing. Here's your minimal raise. But if you walk in and be like, this is how I made the team better, and I did this, and this is how I made this system better, and this is how I did this, and this is the contribution that it had, and this rippling effect of like how that helped other people. And by the way, here's all this documentation I've been writing that the next person you can hire, they can use all this documentation, and they're going to onboard even faster. You're going to blow their mind. You walk in with a list of accomplishments, and the impact that that list of accomplishment has, you're going to blow their mind. Like, I guarantee you're going to like catch them off guard and be like, whoa. Like, that's amazing. Look at all the stuff that you're doing. So the more impact that you can have, the better. And it just, it helps you make that impact. And then you're the kind of developer that other people want to have around. Not, not that you're going to be like the note taker and the documentation person or anything like that. But you're letting them know like, hey, I started this documentation effort. Everyone needs to contribute to this, not just me. I'm contributing to it to, so I can grow and I learn all about these systems and whatever. Anyway, um, it's just, it's going to make you better primarily, but then it's also going to make the team better. And the more you can quantify how that makes the team better, the more opportunity you're going to have for like more advancement, faster advancement, faster raises, all that kind of stuff, promotions and so on. Um, you know, as you go and, and put that stuff on your resume and go to other companies, you're more likely to really stand out as an applicant because you're also showing that impact. Because again, on a resume, it's like, it's one thing to say, I did this, I did this, I did this. But if you can say, I did this, and this is how it made this thing 25% faster. And I did this and it reduced our team organization time by 10%. That's a cumulative effect that can turn into real dollars saved from an organization point of view. And those are the kinds of things that really stand out to managers. It's like, I want that person to come here and do that. And so you're going to stand out as an applicant as well when you're, when you're looking for this kind of stuff. So the more of that that you can kind of quantify on a resume, the better. Cool. I'm going to give everybody two minutes to do exclamation point giveaway down here. I'm going to draw at 44 minutes to the hour for a coupon code on the website. Um, and you will need to be in chat to claim it. And then uh, I will send you a coupon code after that. Cool deal. Hope everyone's doing well. Good to see Britt dropping in as well. Um, who else is hanging out? We got Chewy in chat. 
Ash is still hanging out with us. Uh, RJM, good to see you as well. Um, Brett was saying, oh, it wasn't me. I think when I was talking about like people that I really want to work at. Hey, Alcasted, good to see you as well. Thanks for dropping in. So yeah, we're going to do a coupon code for the, uh, the uh, Cool 3D Things website. Yeah, ignore the message. It's just we had two giveaways today. One was for a spool of film, and this one's going to be for a product on, on the website. And primarily the website right now is like a lot of laser engraving, lots of different themes and, you know, tons of like witty, sarcastic kind of stuff. Um, but if you want to hang on to that coupon code and apply it to something in the future, I'm not going to put an expiration date on it. Um, so yeah, you'll be able to use that whenever you want. Um, I'm also hoping that when I build these coupon codes that they're going to stack. And if they don't stack, then let me know and I'll reissue like a coupon code of everything stacked up. So you got 30 seconds left to get on the giveaway. Awesome. You got 20 seconds to get on the giveaway and then we will, uh, we will draw. So we are going to give away daily for a, uh, cool 3d things coupon. All right. Five seconds, three, two, one, here we go. Yay, um, RGM has been the recipient in the past of stuff that we've custom laser engraved, made some really cool keychains and stuff like that. So yeah, congratulations. Hey, the claim worked. How about that? The timer went off. It told you you claimed the thing. I fixed the bug. Yeah. Um, I realized it was a really dumb thing that I, I messed up on my side, so I got it fixed. Um, cool deal. Well, that was fast. <laughs> that was easy. Um, cool. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, to RC Maniac for the filament and to RJM for the uh, for the coupon code. So I'll send you that coupon code, and then you can go pick anything off the website if you want more laser engraving stuff, keychains. I got keychains. I got coasters. I got you know all the laser engraved signs, all that kind of stuff that we can do. Um, yeah, lots of lots of stuff on there to pick from, or you can just hang on to it if you want to stack them up and like get a get a cosplay helmet or something down the road. Um, there won't be an expiration date on it. So send me a, a Twitch message and I'll send that over to you. RC, um, I will contact you over our usual channel and I'll send you those coupon codes for the Polymaker. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's go see who else is uh, hanging out today. It's a Sunday afternoon. Who streams on a Sunday afternoon anymore? Let's see who else is uh, hanging out here. Mojo coming in. Looking at all the points, look at that, 900 points, because Mojo was hanging out on the stream last night, and we were, like, giving out giveaway points like Oprah. It's like, you get points, and you get points, and you get points, and you get points. Everybody got points for hanging out on chat last night. In fact, in fact, just because y'all are hanging out today, and y'all had to sit through me going on and on and on about all those uh, things to do, starting a new job, here's 150 points for everybody. Let's go see who else is streaming this afternoon. See who we can go right into. Uh, we got, uh, let's see, we got some software. We got some maker stuff. We got some game development. We got some art stuff. We got some Rust stuff. Two today. I haven't raided into them in a long time. But I do love me a dad joke. All right. We have a raid target, everybody. Um, this is someone that we haven't actually uh, raided into in a long time. Her name's Mel. And uh, let's go do this. So I'm going to do bang raid. And we're going to grab a dad joke because you know me. I love my dad jokes. So please go grab this raid message. We're going to go raid over to Juicebox Hero. Her name is Mel. Fantastic programmer. Loves her community. She's very interactive. Um, very respectful person. Please be respectful as well in, uh, in their channel. And uh, we're going to stop that raid. We're going to go head over there. And uh, we'll say hi. I'm going to hang out for a little bit, but then i got to go take care of dinner and stuff like that. Uh, when the Dragon Head giveaway is, it's going to be early August. So, yeah. exchange. You can exchange the points for tokens anytime until the, uh, the end of July 31st. After that, the token exchange is going to stop. But until I actually do the giveaway, any tokens you have left over, you'll be able to apply to any of those prizes. So that'll that'll work after the fact, but once I do the drawings, then all the tokens go away anyway. 
So make sure that you allocate 100% of the tokens that you exchange your points for. Make sure you allocate 100% of those tokens to the prizes that you want. And uh, yeah, we'll talk more about that kind of as we go. So July 31st is the last day that you can exchange your points for tokens. And then uh, I'll be in Canada for a couple of days, the first part of August. And then after that, uh, I'll do the drawing once I get back to Colorado. Um, and I'll make sure that that's out on social so everybody knows when to come back. You don't have to be present to get the prize. Whoever wins, wins. But if you are present in chat, you're going to get something extra on top of the prize. I'm not going to tell you what that is yet. All right, let's go say hi to Mel, and uh, we'll catch you all on Tuesday. I'll be doing some more coding. And uh, thanks for hanging out today. Thanks again for the contributions, uh, especially to uh, Reactor Tech for that other big contribution today. Thank you so much. We'll see you over on Mel's channel. Cheers.